So uh, this data I'm going to use is actually coming from a, another service management tool, so VMware Service Manager. Some of you uh, may or may not have heard of it, uh, but it doesn't really matter uh, where this data is coming from. Uh, ultimately, it's coming uh, from a database, and it's a particular view. So uh, I can see that uh, very shortly from my data, uh, my dashboard that I've, I've got running here. So for those who haven't seen Sherwell, uh, what you're looking at here is, is pretty much uh, the main dashboards within Sherwell that, dis that displays the data that you're after. So from my perspective, it's, it's my work, so these are uh, my call records uh, that I can see here, and there's a few group tallies of numbers and things like that. Uh, a number of the dashboards are quite executive looking in terms of trends and things like that. Uh, more uh, Others are more operational. So let's have a look at how we can get a view into other calls. So I've just called them legacy calls here. So Think about it as, as data coming from a legacy uh, system. So these will be old client server type based systems uh, and you can, you can uh, get a view into that data and then perhaps do something with it. Now uh, what we're finding is uh, that, that people who want to migrate off of their legacy systems and, and old service desk or help desk or, or call ticketing systems, call them what you like, uh, how do we get that data or some of that useful data that's in there into something like Sherwell? So what we can do here is uh, get a view of the data. So I've got a pretty basic view here showing you that uh, at, at the top here we've got uh, our open calls. So that can always be quite useful because there's nothing worse than having a whole bunch of open calls and then you move to a new system. It's like, well, what do we do with those current open calls? So here's a view of those uh, coming in here now, and down below here are the uh, the closed calls. So let's have a, have a little look at uh, what an open call would look like. So uh, for those that are, are familiar with Service Manager, it has a particular kind of data set. So we have customers, organizations, uh, services, a description. Uh, over on the right hand side we've got dates and uh, type tiers, priority type information. And this isn't everything, this is just what I've decided to to display here on this form. And down below here we've got our call history, so anything that was, uh, any actions taken on that call uh, will be in the call history. So this is pretty uh, basic information coming through from an old system, but remember this is a view. I, I haven't imported this data as yet, and I'm, I may or may not want to do that. Uh, but I will show you how, how we can do that. So just as a, just as a quick uh, phone and, and visual check, is everything, uh, everything all good? Yeah, fine. I'm going to take that as, as we're all good, otherwise uh, uh, someone would have said something. So um, we can scroll through some of these uh, records here and you can see that the various the description changes and, and, and things like that, the history changes, but showing you that we have a, um, you know, a, a bulk of information there that we want. And let's say, well, actually I want to bring that record in so I can get a view into that and, and I can migrate that call. So you notice this little button here has become available to me because this call, uh, these details here are not currently within Sherwell, so I can migrate that call. So. Uh, I can click on a button here and it's going to say, well, you're about to migrate this call from, from VSM to CSM. So VSM being VMware Service Manager in this instance, CSM being Sherwell Service Management. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure about that. So I'm going to click OK. And it's going to create that call. And I can uh, migrate as much or as little information as I wish. So you can see in the background there, I've got the customer, I've got the description, migrated call. It's telling me that call 17 has been migrated. Uh, from VMware to Sherwell, and it's saying please select an appropriate service category and, and subcategory. So I can click OK there, you drag that up, and we can see the current VSM calls that are now linked uh, to that record, or that real record that is actually in Sherwell. And because it's in Sherwell now, I get uh, I, I'm, uh, what's available to me is my new services, my new categories, my new subcategories. So I would have to map that data if I wanted to do that automatically. Uh, otherwise, I can choose it from here. So we can see from the, the current VSM call at the bottom of the screen, it's about email. So I can choose email there. And I'll choose a, a category of some description. Um, might have been about the desktop client. And then, of course, I would just 
um, submit that as an incident and uh, we can carry on with our troubleshooting, etc. Bear in mind on my VSM call details tab, I can always go back to what that original call was and I can even go and view that record in its entirety. So I get a I get a double view. I can I can get the view from the VSM call, I can get its call history here, and of course I can get the current call that it's about that I migrated to. So that's just giving you a little little example there of how easy it is to uh, migrate data into Sherwell. Once you've got a connection into your database, and more, more importantly, you've got a database view that has the appropriate fields uh, that you want to see or indeed migrate into Sherwell. So when I say appropriate fields, you'll be asking names of, of categories and types and, and priorities and urgencies. You don't want to be having reference numbers or, or things like that. Okay, so just heading home, that's um, just a, a, a little example there of a, of a SQL view coming back to my work here. If that all seems a bit too much, uh, if you happen to have an HTML version of your current uh, tool or your old tool, then you can actually create a dashboard within Surewell, and this is what you're looking at here is a dashboard, that connects directly to that HTML version. So this, this dashboard has a widget on it, it's, a, it's an HTML widget, and I can log uh, directly into into VSM here and and actually look at calls directly within Sherwell. So uh, it may seem a bit odd, but um, but what I'm saying is uh, from Sherwell Service Management, I can get a view into any other tool uh, if it has an HTML uh, access to it. And from here, I can well because it's it happens to be. Um, Service Manager, I can log in here. I can do various things, including close the call. So I could update it and close it directly from within Sherwell. So I don't even have to migrate the data if I don't want to. So maybe taking it to a little bit of an extreme, but uh, that just gives you uh, a bit of an idea of the kind of integration that you can do within Sherwell from not only from a data perspective, but from a data view perspective. Now, carrying on with the a theme of browser, I've also can get a view into network monitoring tools. So a lot of network monitoring tools have dashboards uh, that can be uh, made available to various people. But how do you get that out there? You go put links on an intranet, or you know, if I'm on the service desk, I might have to crank up a browser and, and have a look at it there. Or I can put a browser widget onto uh, a dashboard within Sherwell and then display it directly within Sherwell. So again, having that single pane of glass into not only your legacy data, but potentially your uh, network monitoring and um, sort of enterprise management data as, as well. So you can see here, this little example here is, is SolarWinds, and that's live on the internet right now. So it's a, it's a live demo system. So we're uh, hooking directly into that. So um, that can be some pretty powerful stuff. And this is on the assumption that you can actually run this, this dashboard. Of course, there would be security around that. And you want to be a little bit careful. You don't want to be necessarily opening up all sorts of information to everyone, but you can limit that through appropriate security. Now, just before we move on to showing you uh, working with some data that's imported uh, from a SQL database, so the, the first... Um, the first example there was was viewing that legacy data. I, I want to move on to actually importing some data now, particularly around assets and, and showing some asset management. So any questions around the, those legacy calls and, and migrating those legacy calls and, and how um, pretty much it's not too much of a nightmare? Sounds like it must be no. a dream then. No nightmares. <laughs> Must be. All right, let's uh, carry on and, and uh, show you uh, what some data being imported from SQL can look like and the sorts of things that you can then do with it. Now, I want to show you that from a, a CMDB or, or an asset management perspective. So, so sure, Surewell enables you to create records within Surewell, you know, create asset records. Uh, create software license records and, and manage them manually. But 
that can get a little bit tiresome. And if you've got say, thousands of assets and you want to keep an eye on those from a perhaps a lease management perspective, uh, there'll be some software that's outside of ELAs that you'd want to keep an eye on. And in general, that's expensive software. So let's have a look at what we can do there. So uh, I'm calling this discovered assets. So within this database here that, that you've been viewing, we've got about 1,600 uh, PCs, or well, really devices, because that, that includes uh, network printers and everything like that. And we've got some detailed discovery records and change logs about those um, PCs or, or devices. And that's nearly a million records. So you're looking at a database with at least a million records about those assets. So let's have a, a, a little look in those uh, and we'll come back to the application. So I can just double click there. And these are real records within Sherwell. So these have been imported. Uh, I'm no longer getting a view into those records. So um, there's, a, there's a couple of reasons for that because I want to be able to manage these records within Sherwell because discovery tools have or, or mo well, most discovery tools can be a little bit painful when machines drop off the network. Uh, think of laptops that go outside the the, um, the corporate land for any period of time. Think of machines that are in storerooms, you know, spare parts and all that kind of thing. Uh, discovery tools just just do not handle that very well at all. And in some cases, they may even purge them out completely, completely delete the records. So what I want to do with Insurewell is I want to import that in as to, to what does the discovery tool know right now and then can synchronize with that data. But if something is missing or if it drops out, I would just simply make the record inactive or it's, it, it's, it's not available anymore. But if it does pop up on the network again in a few weeks' time, that's fine. I'll just reactivate it. So I don't want to get rid of the, the record with Insurewell. I will keep it in Insurewell. Think of it as a baseline uh, snapshot in time of that data, but I'm synchronizing it and updating it from the discovery tool. But what I don't want to do is remove records, uh, even though the discovery tool is saying, hey, I, I can't find this machine anymore. I may well know that it's in store or off the network. So here's some data here about this computer. It's got um, various fields filled in. I'm getting that data from the discovery tool. So I've been a little bit lazy. There's not, not that much data filled in, but I can fill in as much or as little as, as I please. So on a tab here, we've got that detailed discovery. So those are, these are the records uh, regarding detailed discovery about that computer. So in this particular instance, we can see adapters there. We've got network uh, details down here, IP addressing, um, BIOS information as I scroll down, CPU memory. Etc. So that can be quite useful. So people know, you know, what, what kind of printers have been mapped and that sort of thing. Particularly for for instant resolution, if someone says, "Hey, I, I can't print anything," and there might be a, a printer driver missing or something like that. And change logs. So uh, this can be pretty cool if the discovery tool happens to return this kind of data. Uh, we can bring in some change logs here and say, "Hey, this was changed from from." A to B, uh, maybe an IP address was changed, a user was changed, uh, whatever information uh, is exposed. So this little tool here happens to be called Audit Wizard and uh, I'm getting that computer data, detailed discovery and change logs, but the equivalent can be done with the likes of Microsoft System Center, uh, which are fairly common, uh, the System Center Configuration Manager that is. Uh, Alteris is quite common. Uh, as well. And, and these tools, uh, because they tend to be agent-based tools, but because they know about what is on the network, uh, then we can get that data out from, from its underlying database. Um, very reluctant to, to connect directly to those databases, so uh, generally we'll be creating those, those user-friendly views in a database and we'll be synchronizing with that on a regular basis. And when I say regular, generally that's, that's once a day at night uh, in a low use period uh, for the database and we just synchronize that data up. Okay, so that's from a, from a hardware uh, perspective there. So let's come back to our little dashboard here because I've got some application data too. So you can see here we've got uh, nearly, I, I think it's around 95,000 uh, installed applications. So all of those PCs have about 95,000 apps installed across them. And of course, a lot of that will be a, a quite a bit of noise, a lot of notepads and, and things like that. So, um, but suffice to say, we can get a view into that if we wish. 
But from a licensing perspective, we probably really want to know about the most expensive uh, pieces of software. And we can do that because we've got an audit tool. The audit tool is telling us, hey, there's, uh, this, these pieces of software are installed on these machines. And you might want to keep an eye on that. Uh, you might want to manage that data. So once I have that data, I can then do some management with it. So here is a software license record here. It uh, represents 29 licenses. So one record within SureWell uh, is really managing 29 sort of separate licenses, if you like, for the software. And that's pretty important because you don't want to be having 29 separate records to represent the fact you have 29 licenses. So within SureWell here, down, the, down in the green here, I've got software license key, and I've just keyed in, I've thrown in, look, we bought 29 uh, license keys, cost us $29,000. So over here on the top right, we've got our asset status from within SureWell and what our external resources are saying. This is actually what Audit Wizard is telling us. So Audit Wizard itself too can, can maintain some licenses and it too has says, well, you've got 29 licenses and I've got 29 licenses here. But we have one record awaiting install. So we've had an install request uh, for this particular license. So we can go to our asset management tasks and we can see here this is an install and it's new, please install the software. So we've got a, a task now to install. So if that install goes ahead, technically we would have then 30 in use uh, or certainly allocated. So uh, that's going to put a little bit of pressure on our license keys. So let's work through here. We've, we've got no records uh, for uninstalls and that can be equally as important as installs. If we can train our customer base, uh, if you like, I'm, and I'm, I'm saying that with a, with an, without trying to be too cynical, if, but if we can train our customer base to say, hey, it's no problem you requesting installs, but you can request an uninstall as well, because money to be saved there. Uh, but we don't have any uninstalls. We've got 29 in use, and our discovery tool is telling us 29 are in use. And when we say in use, it's basically what asset is that installed on. So let's look here on our downstream CIs, our configuration items here. So here's the 29 uh, assets that that's actually installed on. Then we have the 29 allocated. So I'm going to allocate those within SureWell. That's one thing that discovery tools certainly fall down on. They don't really know who owns the computer or who owns the software uh, that is on that computer. And that could be completely different to the current logged on user, which most discovery tools will return. So on my tab here, I've got allocated to. And you can see I've got 29 people where that is allocated. Now, if this install job goes ahead, that means I'd have 30 allocated. I would have 29 purchases. Less 30 allocated would put, give me on hand minus one. So that's how those figures uh, are being obtained. And it just gives you a good, keen little visual way of managing your software licenses. And uh, most software vendors, I will be pretty happy with seeing this kind of information so they know you've got a handle on managing software licenses. If, if you're, you're not able to provide this kind of information, they would look pretty dimly at that uh, and would certainly be looking at doing their own kind of audit and looking for some license true up. Okay, we got any questions there right now? Should um Should I be checking my little chat screen here? No, we're all we're all good there. Simon, you can confirm we're all we're all good to carry on there. Yeah, please continue. Okay. So what I want to do now, I'm going to move away from from Surewell uh, proper just for a moment. So this is this is Surewell, the, the Windows-based client here, and I'm going to move to Surewell, the the portal. So. This is pretty much what a, a customer would view now. So uh, for, for you uh, people out there, you've got a, a user base, uh, business units, uh, people, business unit managers, that sort of thing. You may want to uh, enable them to do uh, a raft of things from a portal. And it, it could be as limited as, as just logging a call. Uh, but what we might want to do is actually say, hey, you can log a whole heap of requests and things like that. Um, so just to give a bit of an idea, again, this is, this is dashboard driven. 
Uh, we have a portal here with some quick menu links up here to, to home, to perhaps a list of my calls, even logging a new call. I've got some favourites, uh, calls and requests that can be logged, um, and even uh, requesting a chat session. So um, we'll, we can have a look at a few of those things now from an integration perspective. But just to quickly show you the sorts of things you can do from a portal uh, once I've logged in there. I've been logged in a wee while there, so it's wanting me to log back in again, of course. So let me quickly do that. Okay, so uh, a service status, so uh, a lot of service providers out there, and I consider internal IT uh, departments to be service providers, they might want to say, hey, take a quick look at our services here. You can see what our service indication is here, so you can see one of our services is a bit of a disruption, and we're saying our virtual uh, desktops are running slow. Just to give a, a little bit of a heads up there to our customers, hey, that, that's our current status of our, our services. We can expose service catalogs on our, our, our portal. Um, you can even develop your own app store and I want to show you this because this is where those installs and uninstalls are actually coming from. So uh, we can put together a, a raft of installs for particular applications and again these will be the most expensive ones primarily, generally sort of around a financial um, policy there. And we can say hey request an install here or request an uninstall here. And of course if you want to know what you've got I've got a My Devices and, and Apps you can see that uh, I'm logged in here as, as John Allard. I hope you can see that in the top right. And John has a particular machine here and, and currently no installed apps, or at least installed apps that we care about. Uh, probably got Office and operating system and all that sort of thing, but um, it's only stuff that we, uh, we care about. Uh, we can, of course, search our knowledge base, uh, even get into some discussions if we want. Uh, but from an integration perspective, which is what we're talking about today, I want to show you from the portal how we can uh, first of all invoke chat session and secondly uh, create some virtual infrastructure particularly around development and test. Now our, our uh, chat session is actually driven uh, from a product called Bonga. So let me just log into Bonga as a representative. So uh, Bonga has two parts to it. It is a it has a representative console, so think of this as an operator or an IT analyst, a service desk person even. And the other part of it is from the portal or from the web, I can request that chat session as a customer. Now Bomgar, if you haven't heard of it, is a secure remote support uh, product uh, that also has chat capability and, and presentation capability as well. Uh, but it's primarily uh, been designed around uh, secure remote support. So we can hook into uh, Windows, uh, Apple Mac based machines. Um, we can completely take over Samsung devices uh, uh, running Android. Uh, and when I say completely take over, that is exactly what I mean. I can completely take over someone else's phone, uh, if they allow, of course. Uh, we can look at configuration, push out configurations to iDevices, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, pretty pretty handy from a, a support perspective. So let's request that chat session as a customer now. So that'll uh, bring up a little a little dialog box here. Uh, it's saying, hey, what what's your support issue about? I'm just going to say, well, it's a browser issue. I click OK there, and that's just initiating that session. And that just takes um, a few seconds just to connect in, uh, confirm that a technician is actually um, online and, and logged in. And if so, uh, I get a pop-up here saying, hey, John Allard is uh, calling in for a chat session. Can you take that? And I'm going to accept that. So over on the right-hand side is, is myself as a, as a representative, uh, someone in IT. And over here in this little box is... Uh, is John Allard as the customer. So if I say uh, hello here and send that, uh, over on my representative side I can see that John Allard said hello and, and I'll just say hi back. And I can essentially have a chat session with myself. So I can say all sorted thanks, send that, and as a customer I can just close that 
uh, chat session and leave the page. As a representative, however, I have the option now of, of ending this session. If I wanted to, I could have remote controlled to John Allard's machine. Uh, John would have got a little pop-up there and said, hey, do you want a remote control? Uh, 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 allow Dave Hayes to take remote control of your machine. John would have said yes, and then we would have been uh, actually having a chat session as well as remote controlling the machine. I can hopefully resolve whatever John's issue was. So uh, I'm going to finish that session. So that's an end session there. Uh, a little bit of an exit survey. If you want, you can configure BOMGAR uh, exactly how you want in your situation. So um, I'm just going to select a couple of uh, items there. Okay, and that's that chat session finished. But of course, what we want to do is say, well, we, we put a whole lot of information in that chat session. That could be quite useful. So really, we want to log that as a call. And that's part of the integration uh, process within um, within uh, Sherwell, where it automatically logs that call. So I'll just jump back into the full application there. You can see the username there, John Allard, uh, that was a browser issue. And I happen to have uh, put a whole bunch of info into the description box here uh, coming from BOMGAR, but it automatically lists it as a call cool source of chat session. And I could then, as an operator, take ownership of that, begin work. Or, or indeed, when it was created, I could have automatically closed this call and not have it as a, an open one at all if the chat session completed that or resolved John's issue. OK, coming back to our portal, let's, uh, let's hit the lab. So uh, the lab is, is really a, a dashboard here that's based pretty much around a, a, a cloud resources. It's a cloud front end. Uh, so I can request resources from a VMware perspective. So these are VMware managed uh, resources here. Uh, this is really great from a, a dev and test environment. So production environments, as far as I'm concerned, should be under the auspices of, of change management. So I don't really think people should be, should be requesting production infrastructure just through a service request. But I think that should be uh, formally run through a change management process. But in a dev and test environment, you know, we want to be pretty agile about that and pretty quick and, and, and make, it, make it quick for our, our developers and our testers to spin up environments that they can use. But of course, you want to have some management and control over that. We don't want to have our servers spiraling out of control, our server sprawl, you may have heard that term, uh, where machines are simply running in dev and test environments because people are too scared to turn them off because they don't know who's using them or what they're used for. The other thing, of course, we can do is, certainly from a VMware perspective, uh, if people have vCenter operations, that enables us to, to not only monitor our, our VMware infrastructure, but also uh, put a layer of compliance uh, over our infrastructure. So for instance, I could request here a compliant IIS server, so a compliant web server perhaps in our DMZ, for our DMZ, or, or it may be an internal one. So we can apply um, compliance type templates or golden templates over top of our servers to make sure that various ports are locked down and service packs are applied uh, and they're ready to go. Particularly uh, useful for testers so that they're testing uh, systems and solutions with infrastructure that's actually compliant to where that, that system will be running in production. And over on the right hand side we've got Amazon Web Services. So Amazon Web Services also has uh, uh, API or application program interface hooks into uh, those Amazon Web Services. So if you're a corporate that actually has accounts for Amazon where you can create servers or, or even have some storage out there and S3 storage and various other services from Amazon, then of course you can build your cloud front end from, with Sherwell and, and have people request those resources. So let's have a look at what a Windows Dev Server actually is. So in typical kind of App Store fashion, if you like, uh, I want to sort of get you a little bit more information about uh, what I'm about to request. So uh, we can see here it's a Windows Development Server. Um, it looks like I'll be asked to provide a server name, a size, and configuration policy. So here's our server sizes here. This is pretty random kind of definitions here, um, configuration policies. But just showing you that you can show up some pretty cool information before people commit themselves to a request. So let's hit that request button. 
And we want to make this relatively painless, so you can see in the background there that uh, my uh, request is being logged, but it's just thrown up a dialog box here saying, hey, um, I'm prompting you for that server size. You'll, you'll remember that from the, the text box pop-up uh, just before. So in here I've got some choices, small, medium, large. I'll need to give it a name. I'll just call it, um, oh, that would be wouldn't it? a new web server or something like that, and I'll put 01 whatever my name is, and then a, a configuration policy. So is it an app server? There's some web servers there, but I might just want this for development. So I've got some, some default settings there. If people want to change it, that's cool. So I click OK, and that's going to log my service request now. And you can see down here in terms of lab, virtual infrastructure, I've got a server name there. I've, uh, I've got a required till date, so again, just it's giving me some options there to stop that server sprawl. I could run a, a business process on that and say, hey, send me a notification when this date is 24 hours out, and I can, I can let John Allard know, hey, your, your server is, is, was required until that date. What do you want to do now? You can see the size policy. And then I've just thrown in some configuration there just so you can see, well, what does that actually mean? It's, it's one CPU. It's got a, a gig of RAM. Uh, and there's some some various data coming through there from vCenter itself and to, so we can create this virtual server. So that is our request uh, that's been logged from the portal. Uh, so let's have a look at that now uh, within our full application within Sherwell. So here's our new request right at the top here, request for a new Windows development server. So I'll just double click that and have a look. Okay, so as an operator, there's going to be a few things that I might want to do, and, and one of those may be actually get approval for this first. Uh, so we might want to send out an approval and solicit approval, even and maybe from a business unit, not necessarily from a, a technical uh, person or, or from a technical perspective. So let's have a look at what that could look like. So I, I just generated one earlier, and, and here it is here on the screen. And this is from a change request. Now, I like, I like to show you this because uh, there's, a, there's a bit of information here and it shows you the sorts of things you can do. So, so first of all, it's telling me, hey, this is a change request that, that needs approval. So I have approval and deny links here that, that I can click on and that would approve or, or deny from my perspective this record. I have some details about the record, but there's nothing worse than having a whole bunch of information in an email and I have to scroll down, and, and perhaps there's a, there's, some of these records might contain a vast amount of information. So what I've done here is say, hey, why don't I just create a report and just add the report to the email? So keep the email fairly brief and just say, hey, if you want to see some additional information, have a look at that report that's attached, and that should contain enough information for you to approve or deny this request. So you can imagine this now being a request for our, our virtual server. So uh, approving and denying in this uh, way means that uh, we've got uh, the use of our email infrastructure, so we can email out to any customer or, or any user within, uh, within our email infrastructure. And when the uh, approve and deny is clicked, that sends another email back to Sherwell that can update that record all without taking a license. Uh, so I haven't really uh, talked much about licensing here. Uh, everything I've done on the portal that you've seen does not require a license, and interacting with Shua via email does not require a license. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility there in terms of getting maximum usage uh, from Shua without consuming all of your licenses. Okay, so one of the first things we want to do from a virtual infrastructure perspective, and this uh, remember is all about integrating to VMware. So the first thing I want to do is, is show you VMware. So for those that uh, have not seen the virtual infrastructure client, this is pretty much what it looks like. So we've got uh, a few views here. This is uh, VMs and templates. So in here I've got a number of folders. There's app servers and dev servers. Uh, so that was the folder that was selected on our record. I'll just flip back to uh, show while there's dev servers there. Uh, we've got a resource pool of low and, and, and a particular host here and templates. So let's have a look at that. I can click on here, hosts and clusters. There is our resource pool. So we've got high, low, and uh, normal resource pools. So this is reading directly in from vCenter, so integrating uh, to the vCenter database and saying, hey, what, uh, what details have you got there that's going to be useful to me to create uh, my uh, virtual machine? So 
One virtual machine we do have running in here is called uh, Ubuntu One. So that's already created. And I'm going to come back to that one and just show you how uh, we can connect into a machine once it's been created. So uh, what we'll do here is head back uh, to Sherwell. And the first thing we want to do is check that name. So we want to make sure that that name doesn't exist. So we, I either have to log into the virtual infrastructure client to check that out, or I can just say check the name. And so uh, what we're doing here is running a, a script or invoking a script here directly from Shu. Well, I've only flashed this up on the screen so you can see it, so we're not hiding anything here. Uh, we're logging in as a, as a particular user, so I don't have to give people permissions, etc., to log into the infrastructure client or to, to interact with vCenter in any way. I can pass the appropriate credentials directly from Sherwell. And you can see here that that virtual machine does not exist. Uh, so that's a good thing. That means that name is all good. And in my little workflow here, I'm saying, look, we're ready from a VMware's perspective, and we can create that VM. So I can click Create VM, and that operation up here is in progress. And of course, I'm doing this manually, just so I can show you how that, that can be done. Uh, but this can also be run automatically from a business process engine. So imagine the request coming through, the approval being sent, it's then approved, a business process running in the background says, OK, we're good to go. Go and check that name, make sure that's OK. If it's not, maybe notify someone and say, hey, the name is not right. If the name is all good, go and create that VM. And what I can show you here in the background, you, you'll probably see down the bottom of the screen, client of virtual machine, that's the, the, uh, the template. Uh, it's completed there. There's the, the machine sitting underneath the dev servers. And I think we said it was in the low resource pool. So there it is in the low resource pool as well. Now that machine, uh, it's just a copy of a, of a template, uh, and that's mainly because it doesn't take too long. Uh, to, to generate a new server in this particular infrastructure can take 20 or 30 minutes. So I didn't want to bore you with those kind of uh, time frames. So uh, suffice to say, uh, we have actually created a VM. Uh, we've, we've hooked into vCenter, and we've done that. So what I'd like to do is come back to that, that machine that we've got running, which is the uh, Ubuntu One. Ubuntu one, that's it. And what I want to do is say, well, if that was the machine we're, we're creating, uh, I want to actually say, well, that machine's been created, and send a notification out to John that says, hey, your machine's ready. You can you can go and use it if you wish. So uh, one of the first things I'll need to do is get the IP address of that machine, uh, so I can actually send a a remote desktop. Uh, file through to John so he can actually connect it. Now, just before I do that, you can see here in this uh, in this little um, text box down here, this is the information coming back from vCenter. So we're not only just sending uh, or, or integrating with vCenter one way, we're not just sending stuff to vCenter from sure. We're, we're returning or, or getting some feedback from vCenter and saying, hey, I've created that machine and here's all the detail about it. And I can interrogate that information and do stuff with it. And, and I want to show you how I can do that from an IP, IP address perspective. So I'm going to request the IP address for this particular machine. I'm going to do that from a one step. And the one step actions within, within Sherwell are the way you interact entirely with uh, the Sherwell database. You can create business objects or records, update records, send notifications, send tweets out. Uh, you can log files, read from files. There's pretty much nothing you can't do from a one step, and it's all very point and click and no code required. So uh, let me just say get that uh, VM IP address. It's going to run. It's going to hook into to vCenter. It's going to send that, uh, that server name Ubuntu 1 and then it's going to return the IP address of that machine. So I don't, again, I don't have to hook into vCenter, and I'm running this as a particular user that has the, uh, uh, the correct rights to do this. So there's the virtual machine, and there's its IP address there. So I can click OK. I've returned that IP address into my IP address field uh, down here, which is great. And my workflow is continued on. It's saying, hey, you can send a remote desktop call for that machine to John. So uh, let's just do that. And that will send an email out to John with an RDP file attached. And we should uh, see that right here, in fact. Uh, there's our email there. There's our RDP file there. So John, 
your uh, lab machine's ready, uh, username and password, I could have passed that through again. I could have made a, a call back to vCenter and say, hey, give me the admin username and password when that machine was created, but uh, I'm not doing that in here just uh, from a security perspective, that tool. There may be some costs around this. So virtual infrastructure, it might be easy to, to request uh, and easy to spin up, but it doesn't mean it's free. So there might be some costs associated with that. And we could have put that front and centre on the portal if we wish. And we may even want to put cost centres against this and actually start reporting on costs back to that cost centre or that organisation. The lab machine is the development only policy applied and you're ready to go. So I can double click that file and just before anyone jumps up and down, I've told Outlook that it's okay for me to run ADP files, so that's just a security thing there. Uh, I can log into this. I'm pretty sure we choose the console here. And just to show you that I can actually log in. And we're logging in. So that's that machine running in that virtual environment right now. Now, uh, invariably, if you're, you're anything like me, you would uh, have deleted that email or archived it away and you can't find it, and uh, that can be really painful. So I can come in here to my lab, so I can log in as John on the portal, come to my lab, and you'll see here that I've already associated that Ubuntu machine uh, to John. So that machine, it's, it's sitting in vCenter. I've imported that into Sherwell, so it's a real Sherwell record here. I've got some detail about that, and what I can do here is, is attach that RDP file. So directly from the portal now, I can basically log into that machine. Uh, so John has always got uh, instant access to his virtual machine uh, to do his development, do his testing, uh, however it works. And bear in mind that we're going to also probably have a business process running in the background to warn John to say, hey, you only had this machine for a few days, so um, what do you want to do now? Okay, so let's um, cancel all that. We'll go home. And the last, um, the last five minutes is really just showing you some integration from a, a mobile perspective. And that's uh, pretty much the easiest way of doing that is with the um, the iPhone and, and iPad app. Now, you might just have to bear with me for one second. I've got a little mini iPad sitting here. And what we want to do is mirror that to my machine. Here we go. So this is um, the iPhone an iPad app for Sherwell, and as in uh, classic Sherwell uh, fashion, we start with a dashboard. So uh, this is a what you see here is a dashboard, and this can all be configured from what you can see from a mobile perspective. So you want to keep it pretty limited if, you, if you're talking phones, but the mini iPad is actually a great uh, a great size to use uh, from an operator's perspective. So again, this is all about being a technician, being an operator, and I'm going out there and I'm going to be resolving issues, et cetera, for the organization. So uh, what I can do is click down here and, and see my incidents. Uh, I might just want to just see mine or I see all of them. Uh, so here's all my incidents. And you can see here on the right-hand side, we're, we've got some location awareness going on with their, with their um, iPhone application. So essentially what Sherwell have decided to do is say, let's, let's optimize these uh, user interfaces for the device they're being run on. So uh, they're taking advantage of location services on the iPhone app, whereas in the Windows app, uh, we can take advantage of, of the full functionality of the Windows machine, which, which we're not going to get necessarily on our app. So it's all about optimizing for the device. So on the right-hand side here, I've got... Uh, so John Allard is actually in Wellington here. That's where I am. So that's why he's 12 meters away from me, so sitting uh, out in the desk there somewhere. And we've got Emily here and a few... Uh, oh, there are a few others in here. They're 495 kilometers away. Emily's up in Auckland, believe it or not. And um, I can only assume that's the way the crow flies uh, because I can assure you it takes longer than that to drive to Auckland from here. But what I can do is um, I can click on near as well and because the device knows where I am, uh, then this will just simply display the uh, incidents that are near me. So obviously it just filters out everything that is 494 kilometers away. Okay, so I can go into uh, one of my incidents there. 
and we can expose as much or as little information about a call as we wish uh, from an incident perspective because you don't want to get too carried away on a, on a smaller screen. But one of the key things here is the one step, so uh, bringing that uh, one step to the fore again, one step actions, uh, it's, the, it's the way you interact with Shua, you tell Shua well, this is exactly what I want you to do and when, when to do it. And I can see the, the one steps that are associated with this incident. So I can look up the, the uh, config item or the asset by barcode, so using the barcode scanner within the, the iPhone app. Uh, I can take a picture uh, if, I, if I wish, and I could even update the location of John Allard so, um, uh, if I want to do that, so that just updates the longitude latitude within Shurwell so it knows where John Allard is. And then there's some common sets of, of one steps there, you know, pretty typical one there, add a comment, so um, if I want to add a comment to this uh, particular call, uh, then I would just uh, type that in, I did this, and usual story, uh, that's just going to update that call. And I know you're dying to see what um, what a picture looks like. So here's the boardroom that I happen to be in. And uh, I can take a picture of that, use that photo. And there's the photo there. I run that. And that's going to be attached to that incident. Now, uh, from an incident perspective, an IT incident perspective, you may be thinking, oh, you know, that's kind of nice, but you know, is it really that relevant? But think about it from a facilities management perspective. I've got a leaking air conditioning unit. Well, let's take a photo of it, uh, and, and then people can see exactly where it's leaking. Um, we know that uh, there are a number of clients over in uh, overseas that are using this from a fleet management perspective, cars and things like that, and they can take photos of damage to cars, etc. So um, Sherwell is very much a service management platform that uh, Wallace it has uh, out of the box IT service management functionality, it doesn't stop there because it can also do a whole lot of business process and, and business service management as well. So um, just to show you that it's not all smoke and mirrors, um, I'm going to have a look up that call 102048. And there's that call there. And that should have a journal entry, so that's my notes that I put in. So uh, I'm, log I'm logged in as Henry Bryce as the operator, so there's my note, I did this. And of course there's that image that I took, all attached to that call, and that might help me in terms of my uh, troubleshooting, etc. for that call. Okay, so I'd like to leave it there. Um, so we've uh, we've gone through uh, integrating with SQL from a from a view only perspective, looking at those legacy calls and those legacy service test systems, where we're saying, hey, get a view into that data, and I might wish to migrate those into it to a real record or not. Uh, we looked at uh, integrating through from a browser perspective. Again, that was uh, logging into VSM, but also that Solar Winds and, and enterprise management and monitoring. Uh, we looked at SQL, importing data from SQL from an asset management perspective, so that's both hardware assets and software SQL. licensing. And we also looked at uh, provisioning cloud resources uh, from a VMware perspective, uh, or even Amazon if you wish, um, integrating with, with vCenter and actually communicating with vCenter and, and helping us be very agile around that virtual infrastructure. Uh, integration to Bombgar Chat. And finally, that, that mobile integration. So I hope that's been useful uh, to you. And I'm guessing if there's any questions, we could certainly take them. Otherwise, I'll understand that uh, it is lunchtime. And you may want to get on and have some food instead. <laughs>